Hi, everyone, and welcome to the WSET Bite Size session on how to identify wine faults. I'm Matt Irwin, and I'm coming to you from Sydney, Australia. Uh, welcome to everybody from around the world to this uh, Bite Size session. I'm very excited to be able to do this session for you and talk about how can you identify wine faults and have the confidence to be able to talk about them to maybe a sommelier or a wine shop and even return them if you find that they're not up to the standard. I'm going to be uh, talking uh, about these wine faults for about 50 minutes or so, uh, sorry, 30 minutes or so. But before we do that, I want to acknowledge uh, acknowledgement of country. I am in Australia and I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, uh, who are the traditional custodians of the land where I am today. I'd like to pay my respects to all elders past, present, and to the children of today who are the elders of the future. Um, I am currently the APP Development Manager for Asia and Pacific. Uh, I've been working for WSET for the past year or so. Uh, previous to that, I completed the WSET Diploma uh, in 2019, and I was been a certified educator for about four or five years now. Uh, I love the WSET program, and I'm really excited that we get to do this session for you and talk about something that intrigues a lot of people. So tonight, we're going to be talking about what are wine faults and what are the causes of these wine faults as well. I've separated those faults into the unfixable faults, those things that if once you identify it, there isn't much that you can do to correct the situation. But how to identify those faults and then having that confidence to have a conversation with either the sommelier or the wine shop. Then we're going to talk about, is it really a fault? And how to identify this thing called Brett? And is it one of the things that destroys a wine? Or is it something that makes a wine a little bit more complex? The final faults we're going to talk about is the fixable ones. Maybe there's something you can actually do to fix the fault and make the wine come back into condition. And we'll be talking about those ones. I can see we've got people from all over the world checking in. Put up your uh, where you're listening in from. We'd love to see that in the chat. I'd like to talk about WSET. We are the world's leading provider of wine education across the world. And we provide courses in wines and spirits, sake, and now even beer. WSET has over 50 years experience in designing and delivering education to help both wine professionals and consumer enthusiasts uh, all over the world learn about wine, spirits, sake, and the recently launched beer. You can take WSET qualifications in over 70 countries through a network of over 800 providers. If you're interested in finding more out about WSET courses, Visit WSET.com to find your nearest course provider. I want to let you know that this session will be recorded and available to watch via the WSET Global Events Hub on YouTube. If you have any questions during this session, I ask you to put them in the Q&A box and we'll try to cover as many as we can at the end of the session. All right, that's all of the housekeeping. Let's get down into the information. First of all, what is a wine fault? It's defined as the characteristics of the wine are not as the grape grower or winemaker would have intended them to be. When they were growing those grapes and they were making that wine, did they really want it to be looking like that in your glass? Probably, if the answer is no, you're probably looking at a wine fault. But what exactly are the causes of wine faults? There's many reasons why a wine would be considered to be faulty. It can happen from the vineyard, into the winery, into the shipping, and into the storage of the wine. One of the first reasons that you can have a wine fault is from unhealthy grapes. These grapes might have been diseased in the vineyard. There's lots of different diseases that we can find 
that love to put themselves on grapes. It might be a fungi and a mold. It might be a virus. Possibly it could even be from one of those climatic conditions like hail. You can see in the picture on the right-hand side some hail-damaged grapes. Once that hail pierces the skin and that juice starts to leak out, there's lots of insects and birds and animals that love to get their beaks and their noses into that juice. They can also put in diseases when they do, but mostly that juice is going to start turning brown. It's going to start oxidizing and it's going to start having an unpleasant flavor. That unpleasant flavor will transfer into the wine. Ultimately, great wine is made in the vineyard. So healthy grapes are going to be the ones that make great wine. You can, of course, as the winemaker, when you're receiving those grapes, go through and sort them out, pick them out one by one. If maybe there are some particular grapes in a bunch, or maybe you need to be able to throw away a whole bin that is uh, seen to be brown and unhealthy. If you use those grapes, you're going to end up having a wine that doesn't have that fresh fruit driven flavor. Another wine faults can come from stressed out yeast. The yeast has to be comfortable to do the fermentation, it has to be in a happy place at a happy temperature with lots of access to oxygen. And if it's stressed out and it doesn't have all of those conditions, it can actually cause a wine fault that will show in the wine as well. So winemakers have to ensure happy, healthy yeast during and throughout the fermentation. Also, you can find that wines maybe have had too much oxygen or too little oxygen during the winemaking process. This can also cause faults within the wine that will show up later, especially if it's been cellared for a little bit longer. If the winemaking equipment isn't clean, hasn't had a nice old cleanup in between vintages, you can find that some of that bacteria and those microbes can end up appearing in the wine as well. Wine faults can also happen when you've got a faulty enclosure, the screw cap, the cork, it hasn't held. Maybe there's something in the cork that's given itself into the wine, dissolved into wine and given it a funky, animalistic character that was never intended by the winemaker. And finally, a wine fault might come from poor shipping and storage conditions. I'm sure we've all enjoyed wines from all over the world, but those wines have to be shipped in perfect condition. The best way to do it is in refrigerated containers, but unfortunately, some shippers don't always put them in refrigerated containers. So those containers can get hot, those wines can get cooked. This can also happen once it actually gets into the country as well. Maybe it's sat on a hot delivery truck. Maybe it's sat in an area in the restaurant or in the wine shop that was a little bit too warm for the storage of wine. All of these things can cause a wine fault. Let's start talking about some of those unfixable faults and when you should probably think about sending them back. Oxidized wines. These are those wines that have had too much exposure to oxygen. A little bit of exposure to oxygen can make a wine come alive, can soften the tannins, can make it more in balance. But too much oxygen can start it to turn brown, turn dark. Oxidized wines lose their brightness in both the color and the flavor. As you can see there in the picture, you've got this fresh wine that has this lovely ruby color, this red color, and then the oxidized wine that has this brown color. It's similar to when you cut an apple and leave it on the counter and it starts to turn brown. That's from oxygen. The same thing can happen to a wine. Now, if it's getting too much oxygen due to a faulty screw cap that hasn't been able to hold its seal, or maybe there is a cork that's let in oxygen, or possibly even the wine's been open for too long. This can be a concern when you're pouring things by the glass at a restaurant. Maybe that bottle was open three days ago. 
and then all of a sudden it lost its freshness. Your first clue in terms of an oxidized wine is color. Maybe you're looking at quite a brown wine that's only a couple of years old. This might give you a clue. Maybe you're looking at a white wine that's got this golden amber brown color. It loses its freshness in its taste and its fruit character as well. You see, wine, once it goes old, turns into vinegar. So if there is that type of like vinegar flavor or off-putting taste, this can show you that this wine has, been has become oxidized and maybe hasn't been held in its best condition due to a faulty cork or screw cap. A good clue when you're looking for an oxidized wine, especially with a wine under cork, is when you pull that cork out, there's red liquid, if it's a red wine, all the way to the top. Or maybe as you take the foil off, there's already some red wine residue at the top of the cork. This is a really good clue to say, if wine is getting out, oxygen's probably getting in. So I'd be looking a little bit closer at that wine to make sure that it has this lovely fresh fruit character. Also, if you start tasting like balsamic or vinegar in the wine, you know it's probably past its best. So have the confidence to talk to the sommelier or to the wine shop to say it is not in its best condition and it probably should be replaced with another bottle. Another fault is cork taint. TCA, trichloroanisole, 246 trichloroanisole. Now this is a microorganism, tiny little organism that likes to hang out in really small minute spaces in wood and in cork. Well, obviously cork is from the bark of a tree anyway. It is found everywhere. I sometimes notice it in bananas and other fruit as well. The problem is for wine is if it's in a cork, sometimes in barrels as well, once it comes into contact with the wine, it dissolves in the wine and it adds this musty flavor, this wet dog flavor, like my mate on the screen there. An unpleasant character that is not intended to be in the wine whatsoever. Unfortunately, there is not much you can do about it, but I will give you some clues in how you can identify it. Because sometimes TCA in a wine can be really subtle. You ever been to that dinner party where someone brings a bottle of wine, pours it around, and someone says, oh, this wine's corked. And then the argument comes out and the discussion comes out about is it corked or is that a part of its character? The best thing you can do to really identify TCA is to give it more time. Allow it time with oxygen because the longer it comes into contact with oxygen, the more evident that wet dog, moldy cardboard and wet newspaper flavors and aromas will become. If someone is saying, oh, it's no, it's just farmyard or mushroom, and now somebody else is saying, no, it's TCA, I highly recommend put that wine aside for a little bit, 20 minutes, half an hour. If it becomes more noticeable, that's your clue to TCA. We're coming up with some new inventions in terms of our enclosures for our corks. There was a stage there where up to 8% of wines were considered to be infected with TCA. Now we're much lower now, We've got much better quality control for corks, but we're still sitting at around about that one and a half to 2% potential infection from TCA. We wanna make sure that our wines are in great condition. So you can see there on the top left-hand side of the screen, there is a cork called Diarm. When you pull the cork on the wine, have a look at what the cork is. Is it natural cork? This is the possibility of having TCA within there. Within D-arm corks, this is a relatively new invention, about 15 years old, where they get the same cork, they scrunch it all up, they wash it, 
and then they put it back together with an inert glue, they guarantee that there is no TCA within the wine. I highly recommend having a look at the corks closely. A lot of people like to sniff the cork. Unfortunately, I don't think that gives you real definitive evidence whether there is TCA affected within there because sometimes it just smells like cork. But if it is a de arm cork, you've probably got a pretty low chance of it being infected, or I should say zero chance of it being infected. If it's under screw cap, also no chance of TCA coming into contact unless it's happened in the winery and an entire batch barrel is going to have TCA affected wines. But if it's coming out in natural cork, you probably want to, and you're not too sure, leave it for a little bit and let it contact some more oxygen and it will definitely show itself. Another one of those unfixable faults is heat or light damage. We have to care for our wines. They're delicate creatures. They need to be kept in good temperature conditions, consistent temperature. You don't want to cook it. Otherwise, I think we've all cooked with wine. It does change the flavor of it. It changes it from this fresh, yummy, fruit-driven character into something that is old, dull, matterized, not really a fresh wine that you'd be looking for. Well, this heat damage can happen in many locations, it can happen while you're shipping. As I said before, if you're not shipping in temperature controlled containers, you do have a risk, especially if that ship is going to be traveling long distances over very large oceans. Also the storage in a restaurant, in a wine shop, in your cellar, is it got a consistent temperature? Is it around 55 degrees Fahrenheit, around 14 to 17 degrees Celsius? That way you can ensure that it's being stored in the best conditions. If it's sealed under cork, it might give you a clue that it's had heat damage if the cork has been pushed out just a little bit. Because the liquid expands when it's heated, out, heated up and then that will actually push the cork. So if you see just underneath that foil that the cork's pushed out a little bit, that might be your first clue that there might be some heat damage. When you pull that cork, if the wine smells jammy, kind of sweet, like a wine reduction or a balsamic vinegar reduction or a red wine um, jus, and it might have a bitter almond aroma, you're probably looking at a heat damaged wine. Similar things can happen if it's got been light struck. It's got being damaged by light. It's been left out in a hot sunny car park that before it's been moved into the wine store. Maybe it's been sitting out uh, and it's in a clear bottle. Wine can get damaged quite quickly by light if there is very intense sunlight that actually does uh, affect the quality of the wine. If you're looking at something that is light struck, sometimes it is a lot more difficult to figure out. It's gonna be a lot more subtle. The flavors of the wine are gonna be damaged into more of the vinegar. You also need to um, see, is the color changed at all? Has it moved, is it more of that golden or brown color at all? Those are the faults that really you're going to have to have a conversation with the person who is selling it to you or has sold it to you. Don't be afraid to take these wines back. They should be able to be um, refunded or swapped out for a bottle so you can enjoy it the way the winemakers and the grape growers intended it to be. One of the controversial faults if it is even a fault, is this thing called bretomyces. Bretomyces is a yeast. Now we all know that yeast helps with fermentation. Well, this yeast lives differently to the yeast that helps with the fermentation. It lives naturally in plants and in wood as well, but it grows a lot slower 
than the Saccharomyces yeast that we use for fermentation. It also feeds on a much wider range of yeast. So it can live for longer and it becomes present in a wine over a period of time as well. Likes to live in things called old barrels. And so sometimes you may have one barrel that's affected with a little bit of bretomyces and another barrel that is not affected. Now, some regions in, in the world have a little bit of bread in their wine and they love it. Southern Rhone is well known for it and it adds complexity. They call it terroir. But a little bit of bread can go a long way. Some people, it ruins the wine because you have this smell of Band-Aid or sweaty saddle or a horsey character and has a metallic finish if there's too much in there. But if there's only a little bit, you can have this combination of both fruit and barnyardy, earthy flavours, which can add to the range. I say a little bit of breath goes a very long way. And if it starts to be lacking that fresh fruit character and seems to be hollow on the palate, that is certainly a time where the breath is overpowering and making the wine into something that is not in its best character. I wonder if you guys have ever had some Brett wines that you've enjoyed. I'm sure you have. There's some great examples out there. But then there are other examples where Brettomyces has made the wine into a faulty wine. It's a controversial subject that we won't have time to get into all the ins and outs of it today. But I do recommend doing a little bit of investigation. It won't hurt you. It's not harmful. And it certainly has the ability to strike up an enthusiastic conversation with wine lovers all over the world. Now I'm going to talk about what I call the usually fixable faults. First one is sulfur. Now sulfur is created when yeast does not have enough access to nitrogen during the fermentation, becomes stressed out, and then it starts to produce nit uh, sorry, hydrogen sulfide. This hydrogen sulfide can have that unpleasant rotten egg, burnt rubber, cooked garlic type of character. It can also happen because sulfur dioxide is used during winemaking as an antiseptic and as an antioxidant. It's a great thing to use during a winemaking because it stabilizes your wine and it keeps it in a condition for longer. And so this wine can be enjoyed over a longer period of time, say a year or two years or many years if the wine is built that way. If the wine if the winemaker uses too much sulfur dioxide, it can still be in the wine, especially if it's enclosed with a screw cap because it's just stuck right in the bottle. Thing about sulfur is though, you can actually help it along and get rid of it. It becomes less noticeable over time. A lot of people confuse sulfur with TCA. And as I said with TCA, if you leave it for a bit longer, it becomes worse. Well, sulfur is the opposite. If you expose it to more oxygen in a decanter, in your wine glass as you're swirling it, that sulfur will actually start to blow off. That will give you the clue that sulfur is present, but after a little bit, it interacts with the oxygen and dissipates out of the wine. The old tricks when we used to have copper and silver coins, they used to put that into the wine. As long as it's clean, you could have an old copper coin, pop it in, that sulfur will actually attach itself to the coin. You can bring that out and you'll be less noticeable as well. I'm not too sure how many people have silver coins hanging around, but this one also does have do the trick. If the sulfur is too overpowering though, and it hasn't dissipated after um, some exposure to oxygen, say 20 minutes, half an hour, I recommend that it is returned to the place of purchase. The other fixable fault, I don't know if this is even a fault, but wine diamonds and sediments in your wine. These can occur as some of the flavors, some of the acids, some of the tannins, they combine and become heavier than the wine and fall into the bottom of the bottle. You'll see the wine diamonds, they're usually in white wines. You can see that uh, on the picture on the right-hand side. And then sediment, I think we're all pretty familiar with. It's kind of that brown or red 
dust or dirt that sits in the bottom of the wine. Now, this actually comes from a process of unfiltered or unfined wines, which can add texture and flavour to a wine. A lot of winemakers don't like to fine and filter because they feel that it takes out texture, it takes out flavour, and it removes some of the good stuff. So don't see sediment and wine diamonds as a negative. It says that the winemaker wanted to have those flavours and textures in there, and all you've got to do is decant it. You can put it into a decanter, but make sure that you leave some liquid in the bottom and all of the sediment in the bottom. I highly recommend if you think you've got an older bottle, stand it up for about eight hours or so prior to opening it. That way, all of the sediment will go to the bottom of the bottle and it'll be much easier to decant. Same if you see wine diamonds within your wine as, as well. They are not harmful at all. They are not going to hurt you if you get some on your teeth. But they don't, they don't make the wine as pretty to look at as something that is clear. But if you have a decanter, pop the wine into that decanter and just by leaving about 30, 30 millilitres in the bottom of the bottle and all of the sediment, you'll have a perfectly clear wine to enjoy with your friends that's probably going to have some pretty awesome flavours and textures within it. Those are all of the faults that I wanted to talk about tonight and how to identify them. I'm going to be going to questions in just a second, but I want to let you know that we will have feedback and I highly recommend that you complete the feedback poll, which you'll see comes up on your screen if you've enjoyed this session and you found it informative. This is through, done through the WSET Event Hub on YouTube and a replay of this session will be available to watch on the WSET Events Hub through YouTube and will be emailed to you as well. If you're interested in learning more about wine, spirits, sake and beer, please visit WSET.com and you can have a look at the where to study section and find a provider that's close to you. And before I move over to the questions, in just a second, I wanted to talk, tell you about the upcoming webinars where we have the Beer Bite Size Week taking place from Monday 26th of February through until Friday the 1st of March where our beer specialists will be talking about everything to do with beer. Okay, I'm just gonna have, uh, clear my, uh, screen here and just have a look at Q&A and see what we can have a look at. So Mahala says, talking of keeping wine in a hot condition, how can one keep wine at 22 to 24 degrees Celsius? In other words, room temperature. In other words, no K. I recommend keeping your wines cooler than 24 to 22 degrees Celsius. Uh, the coolest place in your house in a dark space. Hopefully you've got maybe a garage you can. There are storage areas that you can now um, take, uh, take out a small locker. Look for the ones that have uh, below ground access and um, hopefully nearest to the ground in the darkest corner. Unfortunately, living in the conditions that we do, especially in cooler Temp uh, cooler climates where we keep our houses between 23 and 25 degrees Celsius, it can be more difficult to find, but I do recommend an off-site storage area. Brian asks, what is the statistic for finding TCA? Is it one in 10,000? Currently, the statistic is sitting at about one and a half to two bottles per hundred. The cork production has gotten a lot better and they're able to um, a, a, they're able to uh, regulate it a lot better than we've ever been able to. I worked with cork enclosure wines for about 10 to 15 years, and I saw it uh, evident uh, less and less and less as we go. Can you see TCA, Brian says? No, but you can certainly smell and taste it. That's for sure. It is one of those things where it's your nose that will lead you to the clues but it's your taste buds that will be the ones that will confirm it when you have all of the fresh fruit disappeared from the wine. 
Anne-Marie says, when stored in a room where the temperature changes often, how long does this have, how long does this take to have an effect on the wine? It doesn't take very long at all, especially if it's going to be enclosed under cork. Cork expands and contracts as the temperature increases and decreases. So if you've got fluctuation in temperature, that contraction of the cork is going to allow oxygen in and wine out, and you're going to end up having a oxidized wine. If that temperature goes too high, you're going to have yourself a cooked wine. Cooler is better than warmer, that's for sure. So if you can put it into a much cooler space that is consistent, whether it's going to be around 12 degrees or so, you're going to be in a much better condition. If you open a wine and you don't finish it on the night, maybe consider putting it into the fridge. If it is a red wine, bring it out 20 minutes or half an hour before you want to enjoy it so you can enjoy it at the temperature you want. But at least that way, it will be at a consistent temperature and it won't oxidize uh, and cook. Brian asked me, what can you recommend what the best temperature would be for shipping of wine in refrigerated containers? Normally, we, can, we will set it at 14 degrees Celsius. I'm sorry, I don't know the Fahrenheit for that, but 14 degrees Celsius is usually where we ask our shippers to put uh, the temperature of the container in. How about the smell of nail polish in wine, Camilla says. Yes, we certainly see quite a bit of that nail polish coming through. Uh, we do find uh, that it is one of those characters that comes out from winemaking, where we have this uh, reductive type of flavor within the wine. It's unpleasant um, and is noticeable for a smaller percentage of the population than other people at all. Now, I've only got one minute left, so I can only get to a couple more questions. Milos says, didn't you notice the SO2 addition has, in fact, different tones from the stressed out yeast. In fact, SO2 additions are usually closer to struck match, whilst stuck fermentations is closer to garlic. I have to agree with Milos. I did combine those two into one section because of time and because this is just a bite size and not to get too wine nerdy, but you are correct. A little bit of reductive uh, matchstick is a common character in some of the world's great wines all over the planet. But if it gets too much, it just becomes overpowering. Whereas the stressed out yeast is nearly always an unpleasant uh, aroma. And for my final question, I'm going to go to Oliver's. What about sunken wine corks, corks? Does that indicate any fault? Possibly it can. Again, there might have been, sir, it might have been stored at an incorrect temperature might have gotten too cold. If the cork has moved, it's probably let oxygen in and you may be looking at an oxidized wine. It may have cooled down quite a bit, which has shrunken that cork and allowed that oxygen to come in. All right, I like this question and I'll just do one more. You mentioned terroir. Can you explain what that means? Terroir is a concept that is both a winemaking and an area that it comes from and a viticultural grape. So it might be the grapes grown in a certain area, the winemakers doing a certain technique, uh, the ability for that whole environment to be captured within the bottle. And that's why we love wine so much. We love it that it transports a place into our glass. It's traveling around the world and checking out these new terroirs through a glass whilst enjoying a huge array and complexity of flavors. Thank you to everybody who has answered, asked questions, and I'm sorry if I didn't get to them. I just wanna thank you all for this session and I wish you all the best and hope you can enjoy wines and identify faults with confidence going forward.